So has anyone any questions? I have to ask about the conspirator, the main conspirator. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know that uh, this group, which uh, you know, engineered the group, uh, was it affiliated to any organization or were they acting independently? Here I am talking of someone uh, affiliated with the Sankhariwar. In fact, uh, a lower rank activist of the Sankhariwar. Now, to my knowledge, not active in there anymore, but who has a career. So it is very likely uh, that this group, with the backing of the Sun, kept the political leadership out of well, with the backing of the Sangh, not if you mean the Sangh leadership. No, no, I don't mean the mm. Sangh leadership. Yeah. I mean the political leadership in the BJP. They were kept out of it. Oh, that. definitely. And they didn't know about it because, uh, you know, there is a fear that politicians can divulge or whatever it is. Yeah. But it was a very closely guarded secret mm -hmm. among a very few. Yeah. So when uh, Advani was taken aback by what happened, it seems quite natural because he didn't know that it's going to happen. Exactly. But in retrospect, the very fact that lakhs of people were gathered there, it could be anticipated that something is going to happen. And that lakhs of people could have been gathered there to provide cover. Mm -hmm. Because if there are lakhs of people there, then the main people cannot be apprehended or seen by the group. Mm -hmm. So that large group that was get the lakhs of people who were assembled there was as a safety cover for the group that was actually going to do the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that follows, does it follow from what you have said? Uh, well, I haven't thought that far, but yes, if you look at it strategically, the, the presence of a large crowd does indeed make it easier yes. to uh, set this in motion, yes. Yeah, and of course, Adwani remained responsible in this sense that he, he made the whole event possible. He called everyone there. So if he didn't correctly uh, estimate what the consequences could be, that's a weakness on his part. Hello. Yeah. 1992 is not the beginning part of the demolition story. The year before that, if you remember, Mulayam Singh, Yadav, who was then the chief minister, is reported to have shot down people in cold blood. At that time, the figures given were 400. And uh, it seems that some of the people who came that time were very much uh, under the desire to do something. And the way the Kothari brothers, two teenage boys who had climbed the domes in 91, they had got down. Then they were collared in the ashram where they were staying and then they were done to death. That's one perspective behind if there mm -hmm. was a ginger group, as you're saying. Secondly, I think uh, the focus on Advani as the focal point of the Ayodhya movement is very, very misplaced. Sangh has always worked as a group and he was certainly the face because he was the party president. But the uh, decision to uh, inaugurate uh, the Ayodhya movement itself was taken at Palanpur in Himachal when Murli Manohar Joshi was the party president and he had the uh, national committee of his choice. That's another aspect that has to be remembered. And finally, there's, you talked about Narsimha Rao. Narsimha Rao had placed central services uh, CRPF and a lot of force there, but that could not be deployed without Kalyan Singh, who was the BJP chief minister. And that was out. The local police, as you've noticed, never wanted to do anything. Mm -hmm. But here, what we have heard about Narsimha Rao in Delhi from then Congress contacts was that he pretended to lose his wits. He never actually had a heart attack, but said he would. And he made sure that he was in bed throughout the period of the actual demolition. Mm -hmm. And then he made sure that no forces were deployed. And the central uh, CRPF, when they reached 
the site at 4 o'clock the next morning or 5 a.m. Then a makeshift temple, which we know now, that had been uh, erected. The puja had begun and the CRPF went and took the prachat mm -hmm. and then they came back. So there seemed to be a lot of more forces involved than what uh, we remember today. But I do remember, and you have not noticed it, that uh, Shiv Sena Bal Thakre, at once time after this uh, event, said that we did it. The, the, me the media reports before the demolition, before uh, 6 December, I think 4th or something, they, show, they reported that there were groups probably from Andhra Pradesh, which gives suspicion about who could be involved, uh, which was actually telecast as practicing with ropes how to bring things down. So there is a lot more than we know right now. Thanks. Yes, uh, to start with the, um, the role of the Shiv Sena, uh, the way I remember it is that Baal Thakir said a few days later, uh, we are being accused of having done this. Well, I don't know exactly he, who did it, but if my boys did it, I am proud of them. Uh, as for Narasimha Rao's role, at least, you see, he could have tried. Like you say, Kalyan Singh was a hurdle for him. Well, he could at least have done his level best to convince Kalyan Singh. He didn't. And, you know, among us, it is very probably because he didn't want to do it, because he was quite satisfied with the way things were going. When I met him in 2004, I think, a few years before his death, when he was retired, I told him to his face what I thought of him. I said, you are the best prime minister India ever had. See, you know, as a as a way of speaking truth to power, I think that was really bold. But, you know, essentially I think so. I mean, in other fields too, you see the economic liberalization which he set in motion, the establishment of diplomat diplomatic relations with Israel. I mean, he made India a normal country again. You see, after this misery of Indira and, and Jawaharlal. Um, so I think he was a very good prime minister. Also, temperamentally, of course, I get along with him. He spoke nine languages and so on. He was a scholar. I like that. But um, concerning Ayodhya, of course, he played a very duplicitous game, which seems, especially in hindsight, to have all been thought through and to all lead to a, a specific result, namely to get the temple out of the way. Uh, the... the Eskimo structure? Hmm? Yes, right. Okay. Um, sir? Yes. Uh, I understand it's a closed door gathering, so I find it appropriate to ask this question. In very, all these days we have these news stories which are reported, which say that a lot of stones are being transported to Ayodhya. So what is the situation as on today? Like, do we see anything that is happening because the media doesn't report as to any construction that is going on? So if at all there is something happening, we don't know about it. Have you heard of anything? Yeah, that no, is the, that's a very good question, but I haven't recently been to Ayodhya. And what is the status of how many stones? That, that 30 years of letting these stones lie in the sunshine, I don't think they're in a very... Because whenever I ask anybody, people say, oh, they're from a lot and they have been transported for many years yeah, till today. I don't know. And so is it, it is, is, is there a group which is doing it, which is helping it, which, which is transporting these well, stones? It's one or? of these local ashrams that has a responsibility for it. I guess they are looking after them, but I don't know. But you say we will all wait for the court order, right? If hmm? at all. So today I think there was a new story which said Supreme Court has agreed to agree on an early hearing of the Ayodhya dispute. So uh, has agreed to agree on what? On an early hearing of the you dispute. Agree. Yes, look into, look into, consider the application of an early hearing. So Supreme Court has agreed to hear an early hearing application. They haven't agreed to hear it yeah, earlier. Yeah. They will consider the application for an early hearing so that we can have an expeditious okay, well, conclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and one more thing, that if the temple had to be built, it could not be built 
until the masjid was demolished. Mm. So we are, if we are talking about temple construction today, it is because the masjid doesn't exist anymore. Yes. So that uh, that tribute has to be given to Narasimha. Yeah, when I heard of the demolition, spontaneously I burst out singing. We've been waiting so long. We've been waiting for the sun to rise and shine, shining still. It gave us the will because somehow, someday, we need just one victory and we're on our way. We've been praying for it all day and fighting for it all night. Give us just one victory, it will be all right. Now, of course, in terms of victory, not much has happened after the demolition. Um, I don't know what victories Hindus can claim. Of course, they have won the elections, they have come to government. But then what? Exactly you see, they, had, they have completely interiorized the narrative of the enemy. Now, let me give a few examples. Um, one big slogan during the agitation was that, you see, uh, we should prefer the national hero, uh, Rama, against the foreign invader, Bavar. Now, that had nothing to do with it. That was, that was already looking the other way. You see, the fact that Babur was foreign had nothing to do with it. The British came to India not because they liked India, because they wanted to exploit India. Okay, they did many ugly things, but they did not destroy temples. And so, and, and Alexander the Great did not destroy temples, and the Shakas and Hunas and so on, they did not destroy temples. So it is something else that motivated this iconoclasm, namely the theology of iconoclasm. And so to, to neutralize the issue by making it, you know, Indian versus foreign, that is already escapism. And even then, in those militant days, that characterized the Sang Parivar. So it was no surprise when a few years later, L.K. Advani, who had led the movement, he of all people said, the demolition day was the blackest day of my life. You see, he had totally taken over the narrative of the enemy. Um, like, for example, I also hear him say, uh, we, um, we should uh, make sure that uh, not only the majority has its way in India. So he believes this whole narrative of minorities. For a secularist like myself, there are only citizens in a country. And they all have the same rights, and we should not do anything special for those so-called minorities. You see, to buy into the narrative that there are minorities in India, that's already the first step towards secularism and the rest. And so, you see, till today this is happening, while we're talking of Advani, he also said um, a, a governing party does not have to offer an ideology. It only has to offer good governance. As if defining good governance is not a matter of ideology. So, you see, he was trying to downplay all kinds of ideological matters, uh, just like the present government is doing. You see, it is building roads and whatever you know, development, and that's a, a very safe issue, and that's what the other side also promises. Akhilesh Yadav, when he was defeated in UP, he also reminded everyone that he had promised essentially the same thing as the BJP. And so, uh, all this development talk, while development in itself is quite, is, is fairly uncontroversial, um, that is only uh, an escape valve, you see, to not have to issue ideological issues. And so that was there already in, in the time of Ayodhya, that is still very much there, only it has gotten worse. You see, at that time you could still describe the BJP as a Hindu party. Right now, I don't know where that term comes from. 
I don't know what action of theirs would give rise to this term. But how are they, how are they gaining strength? How are they gaining strength? You see, the minorities are never going to vote for them. And as for the Hindus, well, you see, that's a gamble. It's like Theresa May in England, she called snap elections, thinking that her position was very secure. She could only win, and she lost. So you see, the, this gamble on elections and you know, gambling in this case that the BJP will get a second term, I'm not so sure. As long as Modi is there, probably. He's an enormous vote catcher. If he disappears for some reason, I don't think that enough people will vote for the BJP. Uh, Baba Ramdev, after the election, said, I voted for them, not because I want the party in power, but I voted for Modi. And so there is, there is little in the BJP's performance that, that uh, generates enthusiasm. And also, you see, gaining strength, what for? You see, they are gaining strength in the sense that they are positioning themselves for winning the next elections and then again do nothing. You see, if a leftist party wins the elections, the party leader comes on TV with a fiery speech saying, and from now on we will do this and this and this and this. Uh, the, P the BJP, just the reverse, they hide the uh, program points which they not even seriously mean to put in practice. No, but which their enemies ascribe to them. In that sense, there is a, an alliance between the BJP, Sang Parivar, and the media. You see, the media always portray them as Hindu fanatics. And that gains them votes of the Hindus. But they themselves don't promise anything Hindu. And then, once in power, they could at least have set a process in motion of some strategically chosen pro-Hindu goals. You know, to immediately meddle with Article uh, 370 might trigger more riots, and they would immediately be blamed on the BJP. If you would um, start a, a common civil code, then certainly, you see, every imam would be affected, which means that you get fiery anti-government speeches in every Eskimo place of worship. And um, therefore, that would be too hot to handle right now. And in that sense, you see the, the, the tacit support that they have given to some private initiative to do away with triple talaq, maybe uh, the, the right kind of step. You see, piecemeal, you know, just sensing how far they can go. But there are other issues that they could certainly have taken up that are not anti-minority, but that are pro-Hindu, in which the minorities lose nothing, but the Hindus gain a lot. Uh, I think especially of Article 30 of the Constitution, which discriminates against Hindus in matters of education. This is not just a theoretical issue. The Right to Education Act it's a very blatant application of it. Tell me, by the way, how is development, that they always talk about, how is development served by the closing down of hundreds of schools? Because that is happening. Now, it is perfectly possible to take some legislative action. You don't have to abolish it altogether. You just amend it so that there is no more discrimination against things. So that is something they could have taken up right away. They could have abolished uh, Article 295A of the Penal Code, which uh, institutes censorship. Um, there are a number of small things they could have done, and they don't. So what's the reason that they don't do? Hmm? What could be the reason that they don't do? Well, because they have a very low Hindu consciousness. I mean, they, they have been overwhelmed by enemy propaganda. They follow the enemy narrative because it is the only one within their horizon that they know of. Because there is no counter-narrative on the Hindu side. Well, there is one of people like Sitaram Goel, 
but um, that is not being spread, that is not being promoted. Even the NCRT textbooks are continuing. Yes. Now, of course, with the with the history textbooks, I can understand a little bit that the BJP doesn't wa want to burn its fingers again after the whole thing, well, failed in 2002 with Muli Manohar Joshi. So there they perhaps can take their time, but at least they should begin. They should appoint the right people. Of that, I don't hear anything. In fact, I've just been at a conference of Sanskritists and historians, and they were all complaining that in their field, the BJP is not giving a lead, is not taking the right decision, is only nominating its own time servers, bureaucrats, you know, not people of talent, not people who are going to influence anything at all in the right sense. What do you think Europe has in store for the future? Because probably it will be the first time that Europe will see a demographic clash between the Judo-Christian world, if I can refer to it, and probably Arab Islamism. And what can Europe maybe learn from the Indic experiences of probably 1000 years? Well, I'm not, not the first one to say that uh, Europe is more and more moving into an India-like situation with the same challenges. As for demography, the situation is rather similar. Recently, some Kashmiri Pandit lady that I know, let me know that she had a second child. I thought, what is this? A Kashmiri Pandit with two children? It's like they don't want to die out, you know? And so this is a big problem, you know, that <laughs> The groups that perhaps you would like to entrust the future to are not having children, and others are. Uh, you heard of the news, I suppose, of Kerala, where the 26% uh, of the population that is Eskimo has 42% of the children. And so the next generation is not going to be 26%, but 42%, which means that in a lot of districts, it is going to be the majority. And you know what happens when they are in the majority. Uh, yeah, so in that respect, you see, India and Europe are relatively similar. In Europe, it is evolving much faster because it is helped by immigration. But you see, the, the higher birth rate among the Eskimos is already there anyway. So those that are already on the inside can do the job, even if immigration stops. And so, you know, the fact that they are, are very unhappy with, uh, or that they say at least that they are very unhappy with uh, the Eskimo state in Syria and Iraq, um, is not that they disapprove so much of what it is doing to the Yazidis and all that, uh, that it is reinstating slavery and beheading and so on. No, it is that it gives bad publicity to the Eskimo cause. And in the circumstances, this is not at all necessary. You see, they are not against beheadings. That is okay for them. But now to have beheadings on TV, you know, emphatical publicity, you know, putting it on Facebook and so on, making sure that everyone has seen it. Well, you see, that's counterproductive. Because in the present situation, you have democracy and you have demographically the upper hand. So very soon, both Europe and India are going to have an Eskimo majority. And then just applying the rules of democracy, they don't have to do anything special. Just applying the present laws, they can completely transform this into an Eskimo state. And so in Europe, it is going a bit faster on the other hand, I must say that the consciousness about the problem is also rising much faster. You see, among Hindus, uh, this terrible apathy, you know, and, and that in the case of India, a, a party that is denounced as Hindu fundamentalist and so on, still does not show that it is conscious of this Eskimo challenge. That is a little bit different in Europe, you see. I mean, parties like Geert Wilders, uh, Freedom Party, they have come about precisely as an answer to this challenge. And the critique they have made of the whole Eskimo theology is very thorough. 
And so by now you see all these, you know, all the things that Sitaram Goel used to put in books like uh, um, the book where he gives uh, Genghis Khan's experiences with visions which he obeyed and which always gave him victory, where he says that this is the same thing that the famous founder of the Eskimo faith also went through. And so you can, you can perfectly uh, psychoanalyze how this whole religion came about, you know, that is not being done in India. See, Goel wrote those things and nobody else is continuing that kind of work. You see, in Europe that has taken off. And so uh, a sizable minority of people by now is fully aware of what the stakes are. Uh, but then on the other hand, the problem is growing so fast that it may well overtake us sometime soon. I wanted to ask about, uh, like, uh, we, our temple funds are used by the Indian government for the good of all citizens of India. And that is how uh, treasure from our temples are uh, used for hut subsidy, are used to build a temple called as Golden Temple. Like treasure, gold treasures from our temples were made to construct Golden Temple. And now these, the same people who go to Golden Temple do not consider themselves to be Hindus. And the same people who avail Hajj subsidy, no other Islamic nation provides Hajj subsidy. Even the Islamic countries, be it Bangladesh, be it Pakistan, be it countries from Middle East, they do not give Hajj subsidy. Only India gives Hajj subsidy. Uh, what are the ways that, in which we can stop that? What are the ways in which we can use the treasure for our own re uh, religion or for, for our own community? Yes, first of all, about this uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, which is a pre-Eskimo uh, custom. In fact, you see, the Eskimos came way too late on the scene to invent anything. You see, everything they have, their, their circumcision, their female circumcision, their fasting, you see, their group prayers, their pilgrimage and so on, they all existed before. Now, whether Eskimo or pre-Eskimo, at any rate, a pilgrimage is not served by subsidies. The idea of a pilgrimage is precisely that you bring a personal sacrifice. So, uh, and, and, and Eskimo law lays down explicitly that every one of us who has the means should at least once in his life go on pilgrimage. So if you don't have the means, well, you don't have to artificially get them. It's okay if you don't go. Namaste, sir. I have a question. So, uh, the recent UP elections was a landslide in one sense. And uh, it was a very interesting choice of chief minister that they chose. It was sort of not expected, at least in mainstream media. So, Yogi Adityanath is known for the kind of profile that he is known for, the Hindu Yuvavahini, and having a hard stance in general. So, do you think that with a majority and 2019 looking good for BJP, and with Yogi Adityanath at Uttar Pradesh, do we have, are these signs of something happening at Ayodhya very soon? What would your reading be on it? Well, about um, Yogi Adityanath, I don't know him personally, but my impression of him was very positive. I was surprised that uh, the BJP won after their defeats in uh, Delhi, for instance. Um, and then when he was nominated, I really liked it. I thought, well, maybe something Hindu has remained in the BJP. Then again, what he has done, you know, he, he also supports uh, the Eskimos in some ways, giving advantages to the poor, hapless minorities. Um, on the other hand, he does some very sensible things. Like uh, the first thing I think he did was to improve, well, at least pass the necessary law for improving the um, course of English in Hindi medium schools. I see that is extremely important to save the vernacular schools. You see, parents want their children to know English because in the labor market it is very important. As um, Madhu Kishwar has written, the biggest distinction in India is not between castes, is not between religions, it is between those who know English and those who don't. So they want them to learn proper English. Now for that it is not at all necessary to go to English medium school. Uh, I have never been to English medium school. 
You see, most of the Russian and Chinese and Japanese and so on winners of the Nobel Prize have never been to English medium school. Some of them don't know English. So this is not necessary at all. And so I strongly support uh, native languages. And I think it is very wise of Yoga Adityanath. I don't think he was the first to do it. I think in some other states it has also been done. But it is a very good initiative to promote English as second language. And so to make sure that when they come from school at, at 17 years or so, they know English well. You know, they can hold their own in English all while not being unfaithful to their mother tongues. What do you think uh, the, we as uh, citizens uh, pro -Hindu, who want to see BJP enact a pro hindu agenda should do to act as some kind of pressure groups to get, make the present government act on uh, some of these issues which have been discussed? How to make the BJP to, uh, or at least push them towards some kind of uh, pro-Hindu? Well, that is the question. I've been trying for three years to find out how it can be done. I don't know how to do it. And you see, me as an outsider, okay, I, I hope I can be forgiven for not knowing. But you see, many people in the corridors of power also don't know. Or alternatively, Many claim not to know because, in fact, they don't want it. They are satisfied with the status quo. Now, I know a, a lobby group, uh, the Indi Indic Academy, um, where lots of people have their heart in the right place. And some members are from the BJP, are active in the BJP, are, have a post in the present establishment. Now. Even though the others, people like Shankar Sharan, like Madhu Kishwar and so on, lament about the lack of cultural dimension in the BJP's policies, all these people who are with the BJP don't do anything. At that point, they look away. When you start talking about development, then they hopefully start defending development, because it's a BJP slogan. Then they start saying, yeah, but the poor need development. Well, nobody is questioning the value of development. That's not the point. The point is precisely the other things that the BJP just doesn't want to talk about. Now, I find that even in those lobby groups, BJP people prefer their allegiance to the BJP to their allegiance to Hinduism. So I, I don't know. I mean, of course, we shouldn't give up. And everybody should do in his own station in life whatever he can, but more than that, I don't know.